Thank you so much for having me and congratulations. One year anniversary. Couldn't be happier to be here on, on the Monday of that important event. Well, thank you. Thank you. And you, you know, you've actually, you've actually had several appearances between the morning update show Community Voices. You're, you're actually, I think, on our first, very first episode of Community Voices. I believe that, I was. That we launched there. So, you know, you, you've had some appearances here on Converge. Uh, let me, first of all, you know, there's, there's a bunch of questions that we ask everybody. We, we've had a few candidates running for mayor and also city council. And so we'll start off with this. Why are you running for city council position D9 citywide? Yeah, because uh, unprecedented crisis requires unprecedented investments in recovery. Um, you know, reality is our city was not prepared for the four crises that we encountered in 2020. Uh, racial justice uprising and a pandemic and economic recession. And we're seeing all of these things uh, in the midst of a climate catastrophe. While our city lacks affordable housing, has more folks without homes than ever before, we need people who are willing to bring uh, not just bold responses, but community-based ones. And I've been a part of grassroots movements uh, for almost my entire duration, my time in Seattle. And I believe those movements have shifted the culture of our city already, and we should continue to shift the policies. Mm -hmm. Right. And now the, the city of Seattle, um, 11,000 employees, I think there's 35 the department heads that, that uh, report into into the city, um, a city council that's fractured, <laughs> frosty at times. They got a good family picture though. You see the city council uh, fam family picture there. I mean, being being on the city being on the city council and a population of seven hundred thousand plus here in the city and all kinds of dynamics going on. What are your qualifications to 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 run for for city council and to be elected? Well, first of all, I think any person who graduates and moves through our common schooling curriculum should be qualified to serve as an elected official in our government. Otherwise, it's inaccessible. It's supposed to be a government for the people, by the people. So I think sometimes when we ask these questions about qualification, we actually devalue the qualifications of people who should be able to sit in those seats uh, and, and construct it around a white notion of viability. Uh, that being said, I think I have checked all those boxes that make me viable even within the context of whiteness. Uh, I have a law degree, I have a bar card, I am a grassroots organizer, I'm an artist, I'm a renter, uh, I'm also the child of someone who experienced incarceration. There are a lot of things both within my professional lived experience that I think make me a great candidate, uh, not just based on my interests, but based on the things that I've done within our city, presently working on things like the Youth Achievement Center with Community Passageways and the Africatown Community Land Trust to develop um, a community held and owned facility that has co-located housing and services and sustainable food options. I mean, and these are the kinds of things that will transform our city when we think about the housing crisis and the issues that we're facing. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I love that you actually highlight there. And honestly, my question is, is, you know, you talk about, you know, community grassroots and really being planted in community. How do you really see that taking shape and taking form um, in this council seat position for District 9? Yeah, so a huge part of the campaign will uh, take lessons from our 2017 mayoral race, which is that if you really want a platform that's transformative for those communities that are most marginalized, most impacted by anti-Black policies and anti-Indigenous policies, that policy has to actually be developed by and in partnership with those most impacted communities. So we developed something that a lot of campaigns have taken on since then, which was a listening post model. We have our, our nine core things that we know in our city we, we need to focus on because movements have made them known, but we also need to make sure we're getting to the tables in community with folks that are most impacted by those issues, building the policy that will change the material conditions that people people are living in. People know how to how to create policies that change their lives. They may not be able to write it into the words that ultimately become ordinance, but by talking about their lived experience and what would make their lives easier, healthier, wholer, we can actually write policies that change the material conditions that people are living in. So a huge part of our campaign will go back to using that strategy of developing a policy in community with folks, not expecting them to come to City Hall on City Hall's time, but going to people where they're at, bringing food, bringing fellowship, bringing conversation and opportunity to write that policy. I think the second thing is really thinking about how 
how City Hall has worked. I hate our budgeting process. Mm -hmm. We have about a month where the, the budget becomes transparent and accessible. Uh, it's hard to read, it's hard to know how to advocate, and then it moves very quickly for about a six week period. So it's communities that really deserve the opportunity to advocate for changes in our budgetary allocations never really get, get that space because it moves too quickly and it's inaccessible. So using the model we built with the solid solidarity budget, uh, continuing to expand who's involved in that process. And then I do think that even though there are things to be worked out with participatory budgeting, continuing to expand the democratic process and how we do budgetary allocations is key to making sure that those communities that are most marginalized actually get to have a say in how we spend the well over $6 billion budget that the city of Seattle has. Right. And you're, you're with us for the rest of the show, right? You yeah. gonna stick with us? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, good. Yeah. Okay, I got some questions. And then, you know, the Twitter sphere has, <laughs> has some questions as well. So, uh, Nikita, this is, can you, I, I guess the best way for it, what is your vision of policing in the, in the, short, in the short term? And when I say short term, um, I say like the next five years or 10 years of policing in, in Seattle. Because um, depending on who you talk to in the city, we get different ideas about you and also the, the term mm -hmm. abolition. What is this? Maybe you want to take a second to explain, even to myself, what is your vision of policing of what policing should look like here in Seattle, say, over the next five or 10 years? So I'm going to speak to what is our vision of public health and public safety, because policing is used within the context of our city as one of the means by which we attempt to create that. The problem is policing does not create that for everyone within our city. I am an abolitionist, which means my goal is to create the conditions by which things like policing and prisons punitive harmful systems that are very anti-black at their root are actually rendered obsolete because we're meeting the basic needs, housing, health care, mental health care, food sustainability, clean water, access to transportation and technology. These are all things that can actually make our community safer because people's needs are met. So my vision for the next five to 10 years of our city is one in which we have actually started to really achieve our goals around affordable social housing. We've de been dependent upon a private market that has no incentive to actually respond to the housing needs of our community members. We also have a very racist zoning code. Like the way in which we determine where affordable housing is built, where multifamily units are, uh, is very problematic. And it's it's based in, in a 1923 comprehensive plan that all the way up through the 90s continued to downzone neighborhoods to allow more single family housing. So as a result, we've actually uh, uh, still allowed de jure segregation to exist. Um, so I really am thinking about the conditions that people are living in as our means of addressing the issues of policing. These are interconnecting things. Um, and I think a lot of folks would try to pigeonhole me into thinking I only care about defunding the police. But really the flip side of dismantling oppressive structures is building the ones that create the conditions that people can thrive in. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, being out there in the streets with you all these all these time, I think that, that I've understood a lot of that. And one of my questions is when you were just talking about it, because we do have 700,000 people in the city of Seattle, how do we really work to ensure that the voices that have not been a part of the process with regard to whether it is participatory budgeting or other measures, even with the solidarity budget, how do we ensure that those voices are really at the center of a process that everybody gets to vote on? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing that we really struggle with in our state is I-200 has really prevented our ability to have targeted responses for black communities, for native communities that address issues based on a highly racialized system that is purposely uh, disenfranchised people based on race, right? So I do think we need council members, we need representatives that are willing to tackle that I-200 issue. We got very close. Um, almost there, it's, it's an issue we need to keep bringing up. I think the second is really having intersectional understanding of who it is that is most marginalized in our city, really thinking about black trans women and understanding the impacts that criminalization, the way in which we pathologize people, the lack of access to work actually marginalizes communities like the black trans community, including our black trans elders. We don't hear a lot about queer and trans elders because often the level of marginalization and disenfranchisement that they have experienced means that they don't survive. There is literally a genocide against black trans people. Um, and so bringing those folks into, into the work. So I've been meeting regularly with the Black Trans Task Force as a part of developing this campaign 
to develop an agenda for black trans liberation as a part of the work that we're doing and thinking through what city policies on a, on a mechanic level can actually transform the way in which black trans folks get to exist in the city of Seattle. How does this become a safer place? I think similarly, we can do that work with lots of folks thinking about our elders that are in the midst of this housing crisis, some of them losing their homes because they cannot keep up on the cost of taxation and on the, the cost of mortgages, right? So we really have to target our responses to the things that we know people are suffering with, our formerly incarcerated family members who are not not getting the reentry services they deserve. And so as a result, are often forced to turn back to things that push them back into the criminal punishment system. It is not a secret to us who is most marginalized in our communities. And so doing the work of going to them, being with them, developing policy with them, it's actually not that hard, but we choose what is efficient over what is effective when we develop policies and we actually need to move to the space of effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Right, so I've got two questions here, um, both of them, from the Twitter sphere. I love the Twitter sphere. Man. Sometimes. I'm about to say better you better you than me. Um, this is from Free Imam Jamil Al Amin. Question Why electorism as a strategy? This summer I remember Nikita was reading Blood in My Eye. I'm about 95% sure that they read uh, this paragraph below, and I can't go into this whole paragraph. But basically, uh, I think the question is. Has your your ideas changed uh, as opposed to uh, basically not being in the system to now running for office in the system? Blood in My Eye is a book by George Jackson. I highly recommend everybody read it because it does have strong critiques of our current system. That particular paragraph that's cited there um, talks about those who run for office with only the intent to win versus the intent to agitate or disrupt, and so. I think inherently in the policies, in um, the stories that that a candidate such as myself, and honestly a campaign that we have brings to the table is inherently going to agitate or disrupt the current system of policies. We have to stop pretending that um, we need to placate to an anti-Black, anti-Indigenous system that purposely disenfranchises people economically so we can have an unpaid or low wage working group of people that capitalism can continue to exploit. And so part of this campaign is about that disruption point, about bringing those things to the surface while simultaneously bringing policy recommendations that will radically redistribute economic and political power. All right, and another one, the other Michael C. One, what do you bring to the council that's not currently represented? And man, it's a wide variety of views that are there. And what would be your top priorities for the council over the next few years? Yeah, so two key priorities. One is thinking about, I think folks believe that I'm not interested in governance because I'm an activist. That's not true. Governance impacts our daily lives all the way down to the material conditions that we live in. One way in which I think the council is poorly constructed is the way that committees are set up. Things like transportation, economics, housing and zoning actually all need to be within the same committee so we can be thinking about the intersections that all of those areas affect while also having a racial justice lens applied to it. So while as a new council member, I wouldn't necessarily get to decide how committees are constructed, I would get to advocate for that change because I think shifting that would allow us to more effectively develop policies that undo anti-blackness and uh, allow us to think through better ways to engage communities on issues that intersect. I think the second thing I've already mentioned is our budgetary process is inaccessible. And it is not something that communities most impacted by the, the justice issues in our city actually can advocate for ourselves in. And so finding ways to elongate that process, make it more accessible, change the language we use in which we, we do budgetary allocations so that communities, not just those who have access to the information or the time to show up to council meetings in the middle of the day or stay all night with how long as they can go sometimes, but everyone actually gets an opportunity to make those changes. Participatory budgeting is one way to do that. It is not the only way. So there are actually governing shifts that I think we need to make. The third priority has to be affordable housing. And a part of that is changing our zoning laws. 85% of the multifamily uh, zone developments happen on 12% of the land. Over 80% of our city is still zoned for single family uh, dwellings. And we have to grapple with the fact there's a book called The Color of Law um, by Rothschild 
that really illuminates how the ways in which redlining directly attaches to determinants um, in terms of experiences with policing or over-policing, health and well-being, education, all of these things are interconnected and our housing crisis is at the root of it and at the root of that is anti-blackness. Right, and real, real quick, I know you had a question, Trey. Um, what what different perspective do you feel that you're going to bring to the council? You know, in, in, in the city of Seattle, people, uh, a lot of times people say that so many of the council members are, are center or even to the right. The rest of America would look at our council and, and say that, that you're very progressive in a very liberal city. Uh, that, that being said, um, what, what is it that you feel you bring to our city council that's not already there? I'm unapologetically about supporting and caring for black community. Black folks have to be prioritized. We have been systematically and consistently pushed to the bottom. And many of our council members get afraid at the moment that a majority white city gets upset that we're doing things that benefit black communities that upon whom so much has been built. So I think that's one thing that's important to bring. The second thing is I'm not just connected to grassroots movements, I am in grassroots movements. And I have no intention of co-opting grassroots movements and claiming the work, rather partnering with, co-collaborating with, and doing that work in a way that actually honors the folks whose shoulders that it's on. And I think the third thing is just, I have the lived experience. I am a renter. I live in a city where I do not know from year to year whether or not I'm going to actually get to stay living in this city. I am on the farthest edge of the city right now almost Skyway, because that's the only place that I can find affordable rent. And so I think having people on the city council who have the lived experience of over-policing, who have the lived experience of working with young people on the south end of the city, who have the lived experience of, of being a renter, not just for a couple of years, but for my entire duration here in the city. And I work within a nonprofit industrial complex that does not value the work that I bring. I, I think I bring something to the Seattle City Council that has not ever been there. Um, and I think it's time that we stop devaluing the work of activists and organizers and actually see that having real activists and organizers in those positions is transformative and will be transformative. And it brings a movement of people. We put out a flyer for a protest on June 3rd and 12,000 people came out to say, defund the police by 50%, invest in black communities and free them all. No one else on the Seattle City Council can do that. Yeah. Two right. snaps, sorry, got a snap to that one right there. Uh, one of the things I really wanna ask you because we're talking a lot about connections, ties to uh, the folks that you are with on the ground um, in your work, but I really wanna ask, when we talk about this huge city, right? This is a citywide seat, right? Mm -hmm. What do you do and what do you bring that's going to bring some unity into this? Because we see some huge divides. We saw them throughout the protest movement, beyond the protest movement. We really have experienced some folks are just not willing to change the way the system is. How do you approach those folks? I think some divides are necessary. They are uh, they show you where we still have deep work to do. Uh, I, I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice when we try to force candidates to talk about how they're going to reach across the aisle to folks who continue to actually dehumanize people. James Baldwin says that we can have a conversation about things until the point that your argument actually dehumanizes me. And I think there are some divides that are just simply about issues of, of how we dehumanize people. And that divide is just going to exist. I think there are other places that are actually a cultural shift that need to happen. We need political education. Folks just have not ever had access to the information. I'm an educator. I'm literally building a course online about abolition for the community to access while I'm teaching a course at Seattle University Law School about abolition. Because I believe that in the end, if people were to understand the problems of policing, the problems of the criminal punishment system, its roots in anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity, that in the end they would then be able to see why these systems have actually perpetuated harm and be willing to make the shifts that need to happen. So I'm an educator in that regard. I'm also a community organizer. And one thing I think is distinctly missing on the Seattle uh, City Council is someone who can organize our council members. Mm. Right. Something that I've found interesting and not necessarily just specifically to you and in, in, in your run here for office is that there's a lot of there's there's a lot of, of, of people in influence who aren't influencing people. 
<laughs> I, I I think that's the that's the, I think that's the best best way I can I could put it right there. There's a lot of people in influence who are influencing people. There's a lot of influence. I mean, when we talk about even our community as well, there's a lot of people in influence, but probably couldn't get 300 black people to show up to Garfield High School mm -hmm. today if they put out a call like I need 300 black people to show up. They probably couldn't get it, but they're influential. And so I, you know, I it just this there's a conversation we kind of been having here that there's a lot of influence people in influential positions who aren't influential as well. And speaking of influence, though, one way to be able to gauge the momentum of a campaign is, you know, how how's it going? How are how are I don't know signups, click throughs, uh, donations? What's going on? Uh, we're doing amazing. Uh, within the first 24 hours of our campaign, I think we collected something like over 600 signatures. Uh, we were well over our goal for fundraising, somewhere like $30,000. As of today, we're above $65,000, where our cash goal that we originally set was $75,000. I think our average donation is somewhere around $50 something dollars. Um, and I don't think that's simply because uh, of, of just influence. We launched our campaign with mutual aid. The very first event that we did was meeting up with folks where you brought what you could share and you took what you needed. We had a mutual aid exchange because how could we jump into a race and spend $300,000 on a campaign when people can't eat or pay their rent? And so a, a huge part of this campaign is going to be mutual aid. It's going to be political education. It's going to be culture shifting and information sharing uh, because I do understand what you're saying about influence. There are a lot of influential people who actually don't have influence on people. I'm not trying to be a singular influence. I'm trying to be a part of a movement that's making a cultural shift. Right. Yeah. And uh, we, we get a reoccurring question here in the comments. We don't have a lot of time, um, but maybe you can ex explain here. Some One of, one of the, the, the comments here is, I do not hear a reasonable solution for what happens if we abolish police. Can we ask about that? This is like a reoccurring question here, so I want to throw it back out to you. It's not about what happens if we abolish police. It's about when we create the conditions in which we've rendered policing obsolete. What people need to understand, policing does not stop crime and it does not print, prevent harm. In fact, what policing often does is respond once crime has already happened. Most people who are survivors of a crime who go through the criminal punishment system will say that they were dissatisfied with what was delivered to them through the criminal punishment system. This is not conjecture. It is actually social science. You can read uh, findings that tell you this about people who are survivors of crimes. The, the goal is to create the conditions which keep people out of the criminal punishment system or needing to be policed in the first place. This is housing, this is education, this is physical and mental health care, this is clean water and good food. Many crimes that we see happen in Seattle right now are actually crimes of poverty because we have allowed many people to live in that position. Seattle Municipal Court is all misdemeanor crimes. Mm. And many of the people that are in King County Jail from Seattle are in on misdemeanor crimes. Many that the root cause of why they committed that quote unquote crime in the first place was a lack of housing. Our housing affordability crisis is at the root of why people think we need police. One other reason why I know that is when you talk to people who are survivors of domestic violence, what they will tell you is the number one thing they needed was housing, not police intervention. And yeah. we've invested more and more over the years in policing than we have in affordable housing. Yeah. Right. Even I was going to say even even parks. I mean, with with the with the homeless sweeps, that was I mean, the, the parks that's parks you know, responsible. The police were then called in now to sweep people out the park. You know what I'm saying? But because mm -hmm. there's a gap between the people who are there in the park who need services or are unhoused and unsheltered, and the only solution that the city is finding in some cases is to send in the police and sweep them out. Which yeah. then leaves people displaced, disheveled, without appropriate paperwork, no access to the few things they've created sustainability with. Imagine if we spent the money we spent on sweeps actually caring for folks who are finding shelter in the parks right now during a pandemic uh, and made sure that people had access to trash disposal, needle disposal, drug user supports, mental health supports. These things could actually change what's happening in encampments until we get to the place where we have enough hotels, enough shelters, and enough affordable housing for everyone who wants to come inside to actually come inside. Yeah, so true. I, and I think too, one of the big things that we've really seen, the pandemic hit so hard 
is black and minority owned businesses. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask you, because we were asking other candidates around, you know, what kind of measures can you bring to the council to really address how these businesses have been closing in the droves during this pandemic? I think we have to prioritize investments in black and minority businesses, whether that's through various types of uh, loan programs or other types of uh, supports that help people build their businesses, or it's even finding ways to forgive commercial rents so that folks who, who have had their small businesses out in commercial spaces don't lose those businesses because of the cost of commercial rents. I think there's also addressing the fact that a lot of our black and minority owned businesses are inside, are in their homes. Right? They work from home, they do things from home. So how do we provide the sorts of supports that allow those home businesses to be thriving, whether that's various types of tech support or again, loans. We can't overestimate how far a monetary investment in folks and their businesses goes. Uh, and I know the challenge often will then be, well, how do we fund it? That's always a question. How do we fund it? And we need a progressive tax structure. And I know that there are some struggles with the income tax because it has to be flat. The next question is, how do you rebate back to those that are already most impacted by a tax burden? But we have to figure something out when it comes to that. We will be recommending a series of taxes that we can use to fund that. We want to wait to put that platform out a little later in the campaign because we are going to be doing listening posts. We want to sit with small business owners, uh, both who have commercial storefronts and those who work out of their homes, and actually hear from them what would practically help your, build it, your, your business be more sustainable. I don't want to pretend that I or anyone else on a staff can fully figure out for small, small businesses what would make things better for them. And again, the thing I think the city always fails to do is go sit with and talk with and build with people. We write policies about people without people. So then those policies don't achieve the material impacts that we want them to have. Yeah. Sorry, are you up in here dropping bars? Yeah. <laughs> bars. I'm sorry. Oh, can you, can you give us 10 more minutes? We, Absolutely. We, we've gone long here, but I want to talk to you about the COVID recovery and things like that. We're going to take a short break right now. And when we come back, continue our conversation with Nikita Oliver. You watch the Morning Update show. The Seattle Association of Black Journalists presents the Morning Update show one year anniversary special. This Friday, March 19th at 7 p.m. Join the Converge Media family as we broadcast live from the State Hotel in downtown Seattle and we take a look back at the last 12 months of the Morning Update show and a glance towards the future. This is a night you won't want to miss and definitely won't forget as we're also joined by Julia Jesse Basa Gordon, Marcus, Harrison Green, Jake Gravrot, Be Unique, Trays, Eric Calligraphy, Bobby Steele, Mike Davis, Carlos Imani, Willard Jimerson, G. Prez, Aspie, DJ Topspin, and more. Woo! So save the date this Friday, March 19th at 7 p.m. across all Converge Media platforms. I did it for the city, I did it for the love, I did it for the people, I did it for us. Community Voices returns for 2021 with two very special episodes that examine the shifting demographics and cultures of Seattle. Converge Media proudly presents Community Voices, The Vanishing Seattle Edition. This is a two-part special that examines four Seattle neighborhoods, the Central District, Chinatown International District, the University District, and Ballard, all Seattle neighborhoods that have experienced great change and displacement due to gentrification, rising rents, and development, as well as found creative ways to stay rooted and resilient. Also, all neighborhoods that have a long and proud history, culture, and traditions that combined help shape the face of the Emerald City as we know it today. The Community Voices episodes will include films plus discussions with local small business owners and community members. These are two powerful live episodes that you will not want to miss. So make sure and save the date, March 18th and March 25th at 7 p.m. across all Converge Media platforms. Presented by the City of Seattle Department of Neighborhoods and Vanishing Seattle. All right, welcome back to the Morning Update show. That's right, it's a big week for us, as you see right there uh, in those adverts. Thursdays, Vanishing Seattle, um, special Community Voices episode right there, episode one, and we're focusing on the International District and the University District, and we're talking about, man, you know, gentrification, um, displacement, rising rents, a lot of businesses, let alone people, um, and traditions have vanished, but we find that there are some that persevere. So we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about that. And then Friday, we can't say this enough, Friday, seven o'clock, the one year anniversary show. 
from the morning up. Can you believe it's been a year, Trey? I know. I mean, it went by so quickly. We've been busy, man. <laughs> we, we have been busy. We're still joined by Nikita Oliver. They were kind enough to, to go overtime with us. You know, we, we go overtime often. We got Nikki Barron here today. So we, we, we got all the time we, all the time we need. So, so Nikita, I want to bring this up here. Let me see. You know, these are handcrafted, by the way. So I'm a Beautiful. Seattle virus success shows what ha could have been done. This is the New York Times by Mike Baker. This was the other day. And this story in the New York Times got a lot of traction nationally. And we, we found it on the big national news outlets. They were talking about how Seattle has responded to COVID and, and around um, some of the success stories and being able to keep the really the lowest rate in America amongst the top um 30 cities that are out there one what are some of the things that, that the city and i guess you say the city and county kind of combined but especially the city has been doing right about uh during this pandemic maybe what are some of the things that could be better but more importantly as well i mean what are your, some of your thoughts on the recovery yeah you know a few things that i think were right uh one was how quickly we moved towards shutting down. I know that was a challenge for a lot of people, but just stopping the spread has been important. That being said, I think our city has the privilege of being able to do that because we are we are a tech city. Many people could move to working from home um, and their companies could afford to make that happen. And in fact, we have seen that tech has greatly benefited uh, during this crisis. You know, so there's also, you know, that that intersection there has to be acknowledged as a part of our city. I think making strides towards things like free transportation uh, was huge. And in fact, has shown us that free transportation is something we could have been offering people the whole time. I feel like in some ways, the, the things that we've seen around um, disability justice and transportation uh, have actually shown us that these things that we've been fighting for for a long time have always been possible. And in the midst of a crisis that suddenly affected everyone, white and wealthy folks included, suddenly we, we could make it a reality. So I really think it's, it's important that we, we ground ourselves in that understanding. There has been some uh, suspending of certain types of fines and fees. So there was a period of time where there were no parking tickets that people could receive. I think that we need to further suspend those fines and fees and stop being reliant on a city at any level upon using those types of uh, punitive responses as a way of funding our city because then we actually require those behaviors or those things that we're criminalizing to continue to exist. Uh, what do we do moving forward? We need to expand tech. Young people and families should not be worried about uh, their internet shutting down while trying to do school and should not be worried about whether or not they can get vaccinations because of issues around tech. We have a serious tech issue. A lot of elders have reached out to me personally and asked me to help them sign up for vaccinations because they don't know how to do it on their own. And so as vaccinations roll out, we have a serious um, in terms of elders, but also racial demographics, we have some serious disproportionality issues to grapple with. Uh, something I think we need to center as we're doing our solution building around our COVID-19 recovery is that our system prior to COVID was deeply flawed. And COVID has merely exasperated uh, the things that already existed. So for me, this is not really COVID-19 recovery. It is actually us building the system we should have had prior to COVID-19. So we are actually ready the next time another disaster hits. And then we have disaster relief already in place. So it's not a question. Uh, so a big piece of this is actually some of the work I've already highlighted to you around being transparent, accountable, and intersectional, but doing that in regards to affordable housing uh, and zoning. If we're gonna come out of this crisis well, we need social housing. We need housing that's not dependent upon the private market. The private market actually has no incentive, especially after a crisis, to build more affordable housing because land in some areas may be cheaper. They can buy it cheaper. They can build it and then they can upsell what those luxury units get for them. So we really need the city and the county to be willing to step in um, on the development of social housing. We need to expand our urban villages. Uh, we know that the climate crisis, the climate catastrophe is going to be huge. We saw this when the sky was nearly blacked out for four or five days. 
here in Seattle. And so uh, expanding our urban villages, dealing with zoning, having better transportation. One of the major things I've heard from some people is even if there's a vaccination site near them, if they live in a place that does not have east-west transportation, they may not actually be able to get to that vaccination site in a timely manner. So I think this is also revealing to us the deep justice issues around transportation, not just in terms of cost, but in terms of where it exists and how it exists. Um, and food sustainability. And I think a few ways to address food sustainability and health is for us as a city to support a community schools model. Um, and by community schools, it means that within the school exists healthcare, food supports, family support workers. We could help schools also, because many of them have gotten rid of school resource officers, have restorative justice counselors, and build our schools into a place that exists uh, both for food and uh, health sustainability, but also uh, sustainable mutual aid networks. I cannot miss the work that mutual aid has done in our city where our, our, our municipal government actually failed community members. Community members through community collaborations responded to each other's needs. I'll, yeah. I'll say this, and I'll give it to you, Trey. I'll say this when you when you say mutual aid. The morning update show, like we 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 once we knew we were gonna do the show, we we knew that we needed to really um, target this, especially for our, our elders and people around COVID. But the inspiration, and we're going to talk about this on Friday, for the morning update show was um, the deaf chef and Chef Tariq at Feed the People. I walked up there from Jackson to Yesler to, to, to Soulful Dishes, and I went over there and I saw the deaf chef was in there and Chef Tariq and a bunch of chefs. So I'm like, what's going on? They were like, man, people need help the only, the only thing that we know how to do is cook. So we just gonna do what we know how to do. And it was that gesture of mutual aid and then the light bulb went off. It was like, well, man, the only thing I know how to do is media. We need to do a show. And you know, so I was just, just throwing that in there, the, the act of mutual aid in our community. I mean, a lot of people, they see mutual aid that's, you know, especially these days it's broadcast everywhere. A lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of stuff promoted on the internet, but this was just walking down the street and seeing like the deaf chef, the chef Tariq, doing what they do every day and was really just trying to feed the people. And it was an inspiration for us in launching the morning update show. And it was a huge part of a lot of folks survival, whether it was the things that the deaf chef and chef T were doing or it's COVID-19 mutual aid Seattle, which has established a number of funds to help people get groceries and pay rent and support um, unaccompanied minors and other undocumented peoples. Um, there are tons of mutual aid networks all across King County that have responded to people's immediate needs. And I think the city should actually do work to undergird those networks and support them because when crisis does hit again, if our end community mutual aid responses are strong, that is just another level of a social safety net that exists for uh, communities, especially marginalized communities. Well, you know, I think that one of the things here, and I'm really hearing this as a theme for a lot of what you're talking about, is caring for the whole person. You know, mm -hmm. um, working in affordable housing with ACLT, Africa Town Community Land Trust, one of the things that I think is so key is it, we can't just build the places and then people come. We also have to infuse it with the culture mm. of that unity and of that village mentality that so many of us come from in the global majority. That's how the first civilizations were built. Mm. I go back to that oftentimes when I'm telling people to see themselves as a part of the solution. And my question to you is, is how do we infuse the culture that is needed in these spaces that you're talking about building and meeting for the city so that we can ensure that people are not just coming there with all of their traumas, but again, being served as a whole person? Yeah, I think Africatown Community Land Trust is one place we can learn that from. Two other groups that I think are doing a really great work like that. One is Queer the Land. Um, this community of folks, queer folks, uh, queer and trans people of color have acquired a piece of land and are literally building a place where they can co-own their labor and co-own the land and a really dynamic co-op model that is grounded in supporting queer and trans people of color. So it is culturally responsive and it also challenges these notions around economics that it has to be individual and actually pushes us towards community collaborations, community care. Another great thing that I know is launching on, on April 22nd is Got Green is launching a campaign 
around community held land that has uh, affordable housing services and sustainable food sources co-located in those spaces, which really infuses again that idea of serving the whole person. It can also be a space, a, a way to think differently or more holistically about our urban villages and knowing that land ownership has been a huge part of how many white communities have built their equity. Now we are in the midst of a climate catastrophe, right? So we have to think differently than just family zone or single family zoned areas and have to be thinking about what does shared ownership look like? What does shared equity look like? But in a way that leaves no one behind, right? So we really can be growing this in our urban village models using the work that communities like Africatown Community Land Trust, Queer the Land and Got Green have already started. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Right. Uh, a quick question here before I let you go and appreciate you going in overtime here. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times, of course, in elections, um, people people make these these it's either, you know, left versus right or whatever. And so one of the things is it's like there's other candidates in the race, two other candidates, I think so far. I'm sure there'll probably be more citywide seat competitive this year. But um, one of the things and when when you look at other media around the city is like, you know, Nikita Oliver, anti-police, anti-business. You, you've spoken around the, the, the public safety issue, as you said. But what about business? Because we, we hear people say Nikita Oliver is anti-business or anti-big business. I'm not anti-business. Uh... And I think that big business needs to pay its fair share of taxes. If paying your fair share of taxes means that I'm anti-business, then uh, I'm gonna need to check y'all on how much taxes I pay a year, because I definitely pay my fair share. Um, and so reality is big business is, is contributing to the climate catastrophe. Big business is contributing to the affordability crisis, but big business doesn't want to contribute to solving either of those issues. And so if asking for taxation makes me anti-big business. I think we really actually have a problem about what people, the way people are seeing things. Reality is I think large corporations should pay their fair share in taxes so we can make sure that we take care of everyone in our city. Unfortunately, the way that we've done things has allowed corporations to pay zero to 2% of taxes while the poorest individuals in our state pay zero to 17%. We have the most regressive tax structure. So what I am anti is continuing to extract labor from poor people, continuing to extract resources from the earth and not have folks actually pay their fair share. So one, we can give workers fair wages, fair, healthy working conditions, and honestly, thriving wages and hours and protections that they deserve. Secondly, we have to address the climate catastrophe. And part of this is going to require big businesses that have been huge contributors to pollution to actually contribute in a way financially that we can do things like get off of uh, natural gases and fossil fuels. And they're going to also have to make the transition themselves. Um, otherwise, what would be the point in having businesses around anyways, because humans won't be here to use them. Mm -hmm. So in the long run, making these transitions, taking care of workers and paying our fair share to ensure that workers can actually live where they work, their families can go to school where they work is actually better for everyone. So that's not me being anti big business. That's me being pro healthy communities, pro healthy homes, pro healthy workers, pro healthy families and understanding that taxation is a part of that. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, we, we have our thing here where um, we, we asked the, the candidates um, for the city of Seattle, what do we need to fight for? What do we need to nurture? What do we need to heal? We need to fight for the health of everyone and planet to be honored. We need to nurture our young people. And I know some people probably think, of course, Nikita would say that, but I say that because young people have been at the forefront of every social movement that has changed the way that things work. Their zeal, their lack of being locked into certain ways of seeing the world makes it so that they have imaginations and creativity that can push us to the next place. And what do we need to heal? We need to heal ourselves so we can be a part of healing each other. And I mean that very, I, I mean that because if we don't get our healing work together as our individual selves, addressing the places where we carry isms, where we carry internalized depression, then we're never gonna be able to see the other human in front of us as having the same value we view ourselves as having because we don't view ourselves as having even enough value to heal ourselves. So I really think pushing folks and, and creating spaces, you have to create 
healing spaces for people to be able to do that work. So then we as a whole people, as collaborations, as community, then we can heal together. All right. You can let people know this is an opportunity. How can people get up with your campaign? You can go to www.nikita, N-I-K-K-I-T-A, number four, nine, N-I-N-E, dot com, or Nikita, N-I-K-K-I-T-A, F-O-R, N-I-N-E dot com. We got them both. Join us. You can volunteer. You can donate. You can be at mutual aid events. You can come to listening posts. But honestly, we just want to share space with you and build because we know that uh, this is an opportunity for a movement. And we don't want to be a campaign that gets into office and is changed more by the office than the office is changed by us. And one way we preserve that accountability is by being in close relationship with our communities. All right. Nikita Oliver, thank you for, for joining us this morning. Thank you for staying over time. Appreciate yeah, it. You know appreciate it. Yeah, we, we haven't gone this long in a, in a long time, but man, um, appreciate you dropping in. This is your first interview? This was my first one. I had to do it with Converge, you All know? Right. Well, we appreciate it. So <laughs> now, right. you know, we're going to have a candidate forum here pretty soon. We haven't put it together. And so we're, we're going to make sure and invite you back for candidate forum. And, and that's where I'm coming with the subsection paraphy five of, of, of the percentage ready. of this and that and yada yada. So it's a lot of stuff to talk about with your city. But thank you for joining us. We're going to take a quick break right now. Oh, we still got it. There you okay, go. there we go. Boom. There, there you go. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break right now when we come back. The morning update show continues.